I think just the feeling we got walking through the school. Like, there's no bells and whistles, there's no computer lab, but you can feel the energy and you can feel the joy in the kids in the classrooms. And my husband and I both looked at each other and we're like, oh my gosh, this is it. Like, <laughs> we, we found our school. Our kids were actually attending a public school, elementary school, down the street. We were looking for a more challenging environment for our kids. We didn't know what we were getting into. But literally within the first semester, we were all in. As a public school educator for so many years, I was a never charter person. I realize now in hindsight that I had been fed a lot of propaganda about charter schools. And when I started actually researching it, I learned, oh, it's really what is best for the education of each child. At Great Hearts, we love to form the hearts and minds of students through the pursuit of the true, the good, and the beautiful. Our students are going to read great books from Frog and Toad in first grade to the Brothers Karamazov in their senior year. We took a look at that book list and we were sold. One thing that we had found in our public school experience is that we were constantly monitoring what our children were being assigned to read. And we really loved the book list at Great Hearts because we knew we were confident that they were being presented with material that was incredibly rich and would really uh, trigger their imaginations and their love of learning. The distinction of Great Hearts, as we saw it at that point, was that it would have the diversity that private schools didn't have, but then also an excellence in curriculum that typically one would not find in a public school. Our aim is to raise up virtuous young men and women who have a sense of purpose and vision, who are endowed with a sense of destiny that's been shaped by the great conversation, and who are equipped to live it out. Great Hearts does an incredible job of uniting and marrying the intellectual formation with moral formation. One of the great things about Great Hearts is that it appeals, instead of what is most base in our, our human nature, it appeals to what is the highest. For me, education isn't just about what you're learning in class that academic-wise, it's a building and forming of character. They're gonna study and pursue those ennobling and lasting things with teachers who are intellectually, morally, and aesthetically alive. The teachers at Great Hearts set an exemplary example. They go above and beyond in also demonstrating these virtues in their own lives. There's so much to love about Great Hearts, but it all starts in the classroom. What I love about teaching is being in the classroom with my students. This is a classical education, and for generations it's only been available at elite private schools. But we seek to make it available to all families, at least to all families who are willing to go on the journey with us. One thing that we were pleasantly surprised with actually when we got to Great Hearts is that not only is the curriculum itself unifying in that it all coheres, but it also is unifying in that it brings diverse students from different socioeconomic backgrounds, different cultures, and it unifies them through the pursuit of truth and through the reading of excellent material. All the riches of the liberal arts those which set their soul free, these are their rightful inheritance, their intellectual inheritance. And we endeavor to give them their initial possession of it. I was initially drawn to STEM type, type schools because I thought I love science and technology and engineering and math. What I found out is that most of the schools really aren't STEM. What they are is giving kids a screen, which doesn't, I don't think the science shows help them learn very well. But what Great Hearts is, is they emphasize science and engineering and math. They give them all those things that actually will make them technology workers. So I think Great Hearts, even though it doesn't advertise itself as STEM, is truly one of the deepest STEM schools that you could go to. We're going to an elite private school without the $30,000 price tag. As a professor in a, a, a liberal arts college, I had met a few of the graduates from the Arizona schools that came and they were impressive. Great Hearts was the best decision we could make for our students' education. As we continue to grow, we invite you to join us for the journey.
All right, I love that video. Hello, everyone. My name is Samuel Heisman. I'm the founding head of school at Great Hearts Harveston. A little bit about myself. I'm just going to give you a brief introduction in five points here. Coincidentally, I have five kids. Four of them are Great Hearts scholars, and they love their classrooms. They love their teachers. They love their speech therapists. My students are Great Hearts scholars, and they love it. I've been married for 12 years to my wonderful wife, Rachel, who's a nurse practitioner. Um, that's two facts so far. I was a headmaster in Texas for several years. I had a school in Texas for several years and I've just moved to Baton Rouge. Very excited to serve you all and bring the Great Hearts experience to you. Two more facts. I love, first, I love to read. I love to barbecue. I love all things coffee and I'm something of a basketball historian. And then the final fact, some of you might be wondering about my last name, Heisman. Yeah, like the football trophy, I am actually related to Coach Heisman. He is my great, great uncle. No jokes. He's my great, great uncle. If you have further questions about that, I'd be happy to answer them in the Q&A portion or over email, but I just wanted to bring that up. Now, what I'd like to do is talk about uh, the overview of what's going to happen today. Uh, three goals. Three goals right now. First, I am hoping in about five or six minutes to give a clear and concise and memorable definition of what we at Great Hearts mean by classical education. I want to give you a three-part definition uh, that describes our approach to classical education. And then my second goal is that I'm hoping to give some fundamental information about the support we offer our families as a community and as a public school. Third, I am hoping uh, to just open dialogue and open lines of communication. As a school leader and as a parent myself, I want you to know that you have access to your school leader all the time. I want you to know that you can trust us and the key part of building trust is that open conversation starting now. I want you to feel like you can reach out to me about anything. There's no grain of sand too small. All right, so a bit of housekeeping. Since we have a very manageable group here, uh, I just ask that you would type your questions in the chat as we go. They will be logged and we will answer them at the end. So go ahead and type those questions in the chat as we go. All right. First point on the agenda. What is classical education? The five minute version. Uh, many studies have been written on this pages and pages of scholarship. I think we can distill it down to three uh, component parts, if you will. So here's a simple definition, a three part definition. Classical education is the growth of virtue in the student through a coherent course of study situated within a magnanimous community or a great hearted, servant hearted community. So let's break that down into parts. And in each part, I'll compare classical education to the growth of a plant so that we have a concrete analogy that helps us understand the uh, that helps us understand what's going on in the definition as well. All right. So. The first part, the growth of virtue. Classical education is the growth of virtue. All right, so back to the analogy here. The goal of a plant, its end, its purpose, is that it bear fruit and hopefully produce more of itself. The goal of classical education, similarly, is for the intellect to become excellent, producing ideas and the capacity to learn on its own well after you're outside of school. The goal of classic, classical education, though, is also for the will, right? Your capacity for choices, for your will to become morally excellent, producing good deeds, just like the plant produces fruit. The will should produce those good deeds and the continued desire to do what is noble and just and right. One of my favorite quotes from uh, Teddy Roosevelt says, to educate a person's intellect, without educating their morals or their character is to produce a tyrant. At Great Hearts, we are committed to moral education and to intellectual formation, right? Okay, so we've talked a lot about humans becoming excellent morally and humans becoming excellent intellectually. That excellence we speak of has a name. It's called virtue. That's human excellence. A habit perfected. Virtue simply, uh, 
simply defined, pardon the tumble there, is humans at their utmost or their best, humans being the best versions of themselves. In Greek, it's translated as arete, a perfection of human form, or humans being the most human that they can be, the best versions of themselves. So that's the goal of classical education, the formation of virtue, moral and intellectual virtue. Now that happens through the next part, a coherent course of study. Now back to that plant analogy, plants cannot produce fruit without adequate nourishment. If they don't get adequate water or food or sunlight, the plant will not generate fruit and therefore will not generate more of itself. Just so if the minds of our young people are not supplied the very best of intellectual and moral nutrition, they won't produce good choices. They won't produce great ideas. And then further, they won't produce the continued desire to make wonderful moral choices and produce those great ideas. So a classical education offers the students intellect uh, offers the students intellectual nutrition made of the best of what has been thought, what has been said, and written as well. The best of what has been thought, said, and written in the Western tradition. Now, this is going to sound like I'm talking exclusively of literature, but I'm not, though literature is the backbone of our program. Our students will study the best of what has been thought, said, and written in literature, philosophy, but also in science, mathematics, language, and fine arts and in physical education. Now, briefly, I'm gonna give you just a few minutes to see our K-5 curricular overview. What you'll notice is that our students study everything every year, every subject every year. And in 612, if we could show that slide, our students take every discipline every year as well. I'll just give you a second to look over that also. There's a reason for this, right? We don't want to over-specialize and have exclusively STEM students or exclusively fine arts students. Right? I've talked to so many students, my own nephew, in fact, who says, I'm really just an engineering guy. I don't really want to read novels. And what that points out to me, right, is that there's a little bit of inhibition and a little bit of fear in encountering that new subject. And one of the things I love about classical education is that it develops a student's sense of wonder. And wonder is that inherent desire and hunger to know things that you don't already know, right? To, to get rid of ignorance and to replace it with knowledge. Students who are classically educated have healthy, robust senses of wonder and enter courageously into the arenas of learning where they don't know something. Every student deserves the chance to be cultivated in every discipline because there is something in every human soul, right? Every dignified human soul and every single one of these students that we're going to serve has inherent human dignity. And there is something in their soul that longs to be educated mathematically, that longs to be educated linguistically, and that longs to be educated literarily, philosophically, et cetera. And we want to give students chances to be educated and cultivated morally and intellectually in all those areas. Now, what I'd like to do briefly is show you, right, that we don't exclusively just teach literature. I would like to show you the healthy, robust reading lists in our K-5 and then respectively, again, in our sixth through eighth grade uh, literature years. So if we could queue up and show that K-5 reading list video and then that six through eight reading list video. I'd love just to show that to you briefly. Read quickly, because these titles come fast in the video. All right, you'll notice some wonderful titles in there. As a kid, I loved Mike Mulligan and the Steam Shovel. I loved the Chronicles of Narnia, and it is so precious to me to see my kids fall in love with the same books. These are books that model excellence in human language and excellence in human artistry, and our kids deserve to get the chance to sink their intellectual teeth into them. Now, 
briefly, I'm an old middle school literature teacher. I'd love, and this is one of my favorite things to talk about, but I will show you, uh, well, my, my, my team will show you the sixth through eighth grade reading list video as well. Again, go ahead and read quickly. So you might notice that a lot of those are books, but a lot of them are poems as well. We love to emphasize the oral tradition of the West as well and have our students recite and be versed in what it means to read and, uh, and recite and, and discuss poetry. All right, those are the first two parts of classical education, right? The goal is the formation of virtue through the second part, a coherent course of study. And then all of that is situated within a loving, servant-hearted community. Here's the third part. Now, back to that plant analogy. I want to bring you back there. Sorry, it's been a little while since we talked about it. Interestingly enough, when plants that bear similar fruit are grouped together, provided they are nourished well and cared for well, they grow stronger. You'd think maybe they're jockeying for nutrition, and on some level they are, but when they're all nourished well by a loving, watchful gardener, their roots interlock and penetrate the soil deeper and they grow stronger and with, can, can withstand more storms and withstand more uh, turmoil if their roots go further down. Further, they also produce an atmosphere, a humidity, which helps make the environment more favorable for growth. Just so, a classical academy must take place in a community of intellectual and moral friendship where relationships are built on the common pursuit of wisdom and excellence. The, this only makes learning and friendship more fruitful and delightful and lasting. As teachers pour themselves out for their students in this community, the students begin to push each other uh, and form a common culture, right? They are affected by the teachers so much that they imitate them and push each other and form a common culture, which is based around pursuing the good, the true, and the beautiful. It's like a positive peer pressure that is formed. The academy must also have built in regularly scheduled times and mechanisms for this community to take place, such as grade level parties, curricular celebrations, robust sports offerings, co-curricular clubs, and beneath and supporting all of this, parent support. Right? That virtue formation is only possible with the support of our parents and the inherent partnership that teachers and parents and administrators share. Right. Uh, one of my favorite pictures at, at my last school, if we could go ahead and share that, um, is, is of our very first volleyball team beating our arch rival, another Great Hearts school, Great Hearts Monta Vista. If you can see that, that was unscripted. I was at this game. They're all high-fiving each other at the same moment. They're all getting ready for a volleyball rotation, but they're all high-fiving each other before that at the same time. And it was just such a beautiful moment where I thought sportsmanship coalesced and where they shared such a good friendship based around a common pursuit of being excellent. Uh, it's just a photo that means a lot to me. So I wanted to share that with you. So in summary, classical education is the growth of virtue. And that happens in a co through a coherent course of study. And that is situated in the midst of a loving, servant-hearted, great-hearted, if you will, uh, community of friendship. All right, it has to happen in a community of friendship. Classical education doesn't happen in a vacuum by itself. It must happen with friends. All right, so that's that's my goal at distilling classical education to, uh, to a three-part definition in five minutes. In future offerings, we're gonna talk about the difference that a classical educator makes. That is one part of the metaphor I'd love to talk about even more would be, if we're gonna go with this uh, plant metaphor, we've talked about the analogies where uh, the plants produce fruit and they grow together. But there needs to be a gardener, and that gardener is the teacher. So on another informational sec uh, uh, night uh, or informa informational session, we'll talk about the difference a classical teacher makes and the difference in approach there. Now I'm going to transition. We're going to talk about our second goal on the agenda. 
the fact that we're a public school, we're going to talk about some of our support offerings as a public school. So we'll transition ahead a little bit. We're going to talk about what it's like when your students are in high school. We're going to talk about some of the things that we have in place. I know we're going to start K-7, but I also just wanted to give you a foretaste of things to come. All right. So in high school, if we could show the side of the, uh, we have college and career counseling in high school and parent education nights so that you can help keep your student accountable and support them in the process and help them find their unique niche in post-secondary, in the post-secondary world after high school. Our college counselors and our career readiness counselors are committed to helping you help your child and helping your child discern what's right for him or her next. And then we'll have parent education nights to help navigate the upcoming years of high school and stay informed about curriculum and instruction so that you can help your student uh, be agents, be uh, productive owners of their own learning at home. All right. The next portion that we'll talk about, the next portion of our public offerings as a school is our sports program. As I mentioned, my last name is Heisman. That comes with a lot of athletic implications. Uh, I also ran, did sports in high school. I ran track, something near and dear to my heart, and I'm committed to making sure we have sports offerings year one. We'll have a robust athletics program, including the following sports, flag football, cross country, basketball, track and field, volleyball, soccer, baseball, and softball. Now, some of this is a little bit supply and demand dependent. Uh, we have to have a significant amount of students interested in the sport. And we have to be able to uh, staff the coaching. But I believe uh, it's possible. I saw it happen at Northern Oaks. We staffed all of these sports year one, and I'd love to bring all of them to Harveston in year one as well. Now, a little bit more about family supports, uh, things in our program that we offer uh, just to help families even more as public school. We have after school care. We're working on before school care as well. We're going to offer transportation for all if you would sign up for our bus services. And there will be free and reduced lunch for those who qualify in a certain income threshold. If you need it, we'll have free and reduced lunch and many, many more services. Now, there is also going to be, um, because we want to make sure this classical education, this excellent curriculum that I consider world class, top tier, making sure that it's accessible for everyone. We're going to have a robust culture of intervention and academic services. Uh, in our exceptional student services suite, we're going to make sure that every student is getting what they need to access this life-changing curriculum. So uh, I wanted to just show you a brief overview. Every public school has these, but I'm committed to making these excellent as well. In our exceptional student services, we have 504 programs, MTSS programs, um, SPED programs, ESL programs, subject and grade level intervention, and we'll have built in times for tutoring and intervention during the school day. All right. Okay. So that's a little bit about our, uh, our services as a public school. Um, I'd love to just go into any questions that you might have. We had some that came in through the submissions that you all fill up, filled out earlier. Uh, so I'll go ahead and I'll start with some of these pre-submitted questions. Feel free to keep typing those questions in the chat as you go. But I'm just going to start with some of the pre-submitted questions that we had earlier. So one of the first questions that we got as you all were submitting was, excuse me, uh, how can students become eligible for enrollment? Is it a parish-wide lottery? So it's not a parish-wide lottery, as families must live within the EBR school district to apply. Right. Uh, so a little bit about ap the application process. Once open enrollment begins, residents living within the East Baton Rouge district can apply. And the dates for open enrollment are still being determined but they will be released as soon as they are finalized. They will likely mirror the open enrollment process in our surrounding charters and, and districts and magnet schools. But once the dates are finalized, they will be distributed uh, very, as soon as we have them. Right. So the next question, do students sit in desks all day? How physical, how is physical activity a part of the day? I love this question. I have a couple wiggle worms myself as a father. Um, no. Students do not sit in their desks all day. Uh, recess, in, especially in K-5, but in 6-7 as well, is an inherent part of the day. 
opportunities where they get to exercise their will and make choices outside are crucial. Um, our, our first and our kindergartners through second graders get a, on average three recesses, sometimes two, but three recesses usually. And our third through fifth graders get two recesses and our middle schoolers usually get a recess as well. So that's part of how we break up the day. But physical education is inherently part of a liberal education. We make sure that's available and at every grade level. And then we also, our students take fine arts. They're building things. They're making things in art class. Our students are singing. They have to stand and move around to sing. And in the middle, in the lower grades especially, you got to sing with your whole body. My students sang America the Beautiful, and they were marching, and they were saluting, and they were moving around quite a bit. All right. Um, the next one, what are the school day hours, and is there before and after care? Right. As a working as a as a family with two working parents, uh, my wife and I both, I, I sympathize with this question. The school day will mirror the regular traditional school day. It'll probably be around seven fifty to three thirty. We're still finally finalizing that with EBR, but it'll likely be around there, give or take uh, twenty or thirty minutes. Um, but it'll likely be around that seven fifty to three thirty range. But we're still finalizing that. There will be uh, um, there will be extra care available. Um, we're most definitely going to have aftercare. We're looking into before care, um, but we will most definitely have aftercare. We're committed to making that a good program as well. Do you use phonics? How do you teach reading and what's your math curriculum? Um, I'll go in reverse order here. And I think those first two can be answered in, in one answer. And it's, it's a longer one, uh, but very briefly, first, for mathematics, we do in K-5, we do Singapore mathematics. And then middle school, we're going to do Carnegie, the Carnegie math sequence. Singapore mathematics and then the Carnegie math sequence. So let's talk about reading because this is the core of our program. Right? We understand the primary importance of providing systematic research-based reading instruction that develops students' proficiency with the basic sounds of language, phonemic awareness, the basic sounds of words, phonological awareness, the relationships between sounds and letters, i.e. phonics, the structure of words, morphology, which includes prefixes and suffixes, reading fluency, vocabulary, and text comprehension at the sentence, paragraph, passage, chapter, and book level. To that end, right, the primary importance of systematic research-based reading instruction, to that end, we have adopted Spalding, Spalding phonics, which is research-based, which is a research-based and systematic approach uh, for reading instructions. Students are introduced to 70 phonograms in K2. These phonograms are reviewed through consistent daily instruction in the early grades, as well as in grades three through five. Phonological awareness is built into the routines of Spalding instruction, specifically during word dictation. Students are asked to repeat given words and identify the sounds they hear, and these routines are introduced in K through five. In addition to instruction that aligns what is commonly called the science of reading, we hold deep commitments to the truth that the content of the literature matters, right? Therefore, concurrent with that reading instruction, that systematic phonemic phonetic approach, we immerse our students in good stories, stories that reflect what is true, good and beautiful. The Chronicles of Narnia, Frog and Toad, Little Bear, Right. And our fifth graders, I believe they read Julius Caesar as well. In addition to this core instructional program, students engage in individual reading practice on a daily basis. In younger grades, that includes phonetic readers. As children mature, they take on the responsibility with our core reading list, the literature books. And we also integrate reading uh, practice in all subject areas, history and science, including students at all levels who are found to have reading deficiencies or just having trouble uh, catching on will receive specified uh, either small group or individual support with an interventionist as soon as we are identifying those gaps or those needs. And we also work hard to develop background knowledge for students because that's key to helping them learn to read. With rich content in history and science, our, that, that core knowledge sequence, our students are able to catch on quickly and make references to other disciplines while they're reading. And then finally, oral language development is key. We model the appropriate use of beautiful language to our students in the books we read and in the way we speak to our children. We hold students to a high 
uh, a high standard in their own use of language and provide countless opportunities for them to speak well and to sharpen their proficiency. All right. So wanted to make sure we gave that question uh, a, a, a thorough treatment because it is the backbone of our program. But let's go on to the next pre-submitted question. Do you currently have policies and procedures on identifying special needs students? Where is the exact location going to be? Any further information on scholar transportation options would be very helpful. All right, I'll try to take those in order. Policies and procedures on identifying SPED students. So as a public school, one of the things we get to do and are honored to do is attend to each individual's learning needs. And the first step in identifying if a student has such a need is, is through our multi-tiered system of support, NTSS, multi-tiered system of support. Each teacher logs any learning difficulties they might see. And then we begin to try interventions with those students who may or may not need those, who may need those interventions. If those interventions are working, we keep up with that plan that we have made. If those interventions are not, we try some heavier ones and they're still in that MTSS program. If those work, they keep that MTSS plan. If they don't, then we might refer for a 504 plan if that student just needs some help making sure that uh, they need they, they get access to the curriculum. But if there's a real learning impairment, then we might refer that student from an MTSS program into the special education program. Or if it's a, if it's a first or second language issue, we might refer them into the ESL program. But first, the funnel through which we determine uh, the specific need is our multi-tiered system of support that all public schools have, but that we take specific pride in, in at Great Hearts because Frankly, if this is a life-changing uh, curriculum, if it's the best education for some, then it's the best education for all. We're committed to making that happen through our MTSS, multi-tiered system of support uh, service program. All right, can we go back to that slide, actually? The location, uh, the Great Hearts Harveston location is on Blue Bonnet Road, very near the intersection of Blue Bonnet and Nicholson. Uh, those are the nearest cross streets. We're going to be, uh, on the actual master plan grounds for the Harveston community, the preserve at Harveston community, but we're going to be closest to that intersection of Blue Bonnet and Nicholson. If you drive by there, you'll see our construction crew working and our fence wrap, our fence signs are going up here in, in, in just a little bit of time, but you can see uh, the, gr the broken ground and the dirt work happening right now, Blue Bonnet and Nicholson. All right, any further information on scholar transportation options will also be helpful. We will have more information about that. We're currently uh, working with a few vendors determining which one will suit our needs just, uh, just right. Uh, but this is uh, transportation is not just transportation for some, it's transportation for all. We're going to determine where the stops are, uh, need to be, and then parents will be responsible for getting the kids to the stops. Uh, but we will have transportation available for all to Great Hearts Harveston. All right, will residents of the Harveston development be prioritized in placement? Okay, this is a good question. And I can see where it comes from since we're on the Harveston grounds, but uh, we are a public charter school, a public liberal arts classical charter school. So we're here to serve the entire city of Baton Rouge. I am sure we'll have kids from Harveston come to our school, but they will not be given priority uh, in entry. Uh, they will, we will serve them and we will love them and we will give ourselves to them, but they will not be given priority entry. Everybody is going to be given the same priority. Everybody is going to give it, be given um, the same chance to be part of our wonderful school. When will we be able to sign up for the waiting list? So scholars will go on the wait list automatically if there is not a seat available in the desired grade at the time of application. If an application is completed, it is with the intention of acceptance, not an application for the wait list. So uh, when will we be able to sign up for the wait list? Uh, it'll become available, I think, open enrollment will probably, this is the same thing as the open enrollment question, really. Um, you'll be able to apply in the open enrollment season, which will likely be around October, uh, will be the first time that you can start uh, signing up and applying for fall 2023, October of 2022 likely will be the first time you can apply for the fall of 2023. 
All right, what are the expected class sizes? How much time do they have for recess, physical activity in a day? And what is expected of parents? Are parents welcome on campus? Can students receive speech OT at school? All right, expected class sizes are going to uh, be different for elementary and then for middle school. In elementary, each classroom will have about 30 students, but there will be two teachers per classroom, right? An apprentice teacher and a grade level teacher an apprentice teacher and a grade level teacher. So there will be a one to 15 ratio. Now in each of those classrooms, some students may have special needs or, or um, something that needs to be addressed through an MTSS program. So there may be some uh, SPED professionals in the room as well, but by and large in grades K through five, it'll be one teacher for every 15 students, two teachers and 30 students per classroom. In grades six through 12, though we're only starting in grades six through seven, we're only gonna have a six through seven first year. Um, Classrooms, the ratio will be about one teacher for every 25 students, one teacher for every 25 students. Can we go back to that, that slide? How much time does young students have for recess and physical activity in the day? Uh, we mentioned this earlier that uh, those younger students, grades K through one, maybe K two, will get about three 20 minute recesses or three 15 minute recesses. Uh, three through five will get about two 25 minute recesses. Uh, and then our goal in middle school is for them to have at least uh, at least 20 minutes outside. But they will also have physical education built into their day in the middle school. What is expected of parents? Are parents welcome on campus for events? So two questions there, two awesome questions. Um, what is expected of parents? In the younger grades, we ask that you be a support while your student is doing the homework and you be very communicative with us, with your teachers, with the administrators. Um, we ask that you, you uh, commit to about 20 minutes a night of homework for your kid. Um, in the upper grades, grades four through five, it might be a little bit more, but in, um, in kindergarten, it's gonna be about 15 or 20 minutes. K through two, it's gonna be about 15 through 20 minutes. We ask that you help your student with phonogram flashcards. Uh, with rocket math and with a few other things, but it's it's minimal support, uh, and the student takes the bulk of the learning. In grades five through eight, or in middle school six through eight, rather, uh, we're asking that you commit to um, that you commit to setting up a quiet workspace for the students to do work themselves. And if if you have the means and are available to help them with things like math or or literature, go ahead. Um, but we're just asking that you set up a a good quiet space. For them to do their work, um, for them to do their work at home, our parents allowed on campus for events. Uh, we will have regularly scheduled curricular celebrations and field days and uh, events where parents, where we're going to need parent support, and where we are definitely going to ask you to come. There will be specific and uh, clearly calendared and clearly messaged events where parents are welcome to come. And then there are gonna be a lot of community celebrations, festivals where we'll need parents to come and support, but also to be just enjoy themselves and be part of the community. So uh, yeah, there'll be specific times, specific events where we'll have parents come. Can students receive speech in OT at school? Yes, provided it's part of their, uh, of, of whatever special learning plan they may have right, an IEP or a 504 or whatever plan they have that mandates it, uh, it can be had at school. It can be had at any public school. All right, what will be available first year? Lunch, aftercare, athletics. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we're hoping, in we're hoping to have a robust athletics program year one, right, with uh, in the fall, hopefully, cross country, flag football, volleyball in the spring, Nope, in the winter, basketball uh, across all levels. And in the spring, uh, baseball, softball, track and field. Um, we're, we're just we're hoping to offer all of those year one. Uh, there will be aftercare, and we're looking at the feasibility of before care. And um, I think I think that um, about about covers that question. What foreign languages? Excellent conversation. What foreign languages will be taught in lower and upper schools? In lower school, we're making the final decisions right now uh, that we are hoping, uh, we're making the final decisions and we're debating, but in lower school, we'll likely have either Spanish or Latin as the language in grades K through five. And then in upper school, grades six through eight, students will take Latin. And then in high school, they'll get the choice to pursue the ancient language track, which is two more years of Latin in ninth and 10th grade, and then two years of Greek in 10th and 11th and 12th, uh, 
they can choose that ancient track or they can choose a more modern track. And this will likely depend on demand and what sort of specialty we have on staff. But students almost always we have in the modern language track, a Spanish track where students take four more years of four years of Spanish, culminating in a wonderful study of Don Quixote and a translation of Don Quixote. Um, or uh, if we have the demand, we will also offer French or German. Um, any of those languages from the West that have been around in the Western tradition, um, I believe uh, in, the, in, in French that culminate in the study of Camus uh, or Madame Bovary. All right. Uh, so those were the last pre-submitted questions. Uh, so I'm happy to take any other questions that might come up right now. Uh, you guys have been a wonderful audience. It's been, it's been so great to be with you. Happy to take any other questions that come up. Um, just take uh, a brief moment and um, we will wait. While I'm waiting uh, and while, while you I'll give you a chance to type here, I would just, uh, I would, I would definitely uh, exhort you to sign up for our interest list and get our updates about where we are in the community and what we're offering and where you can come and meet us and what's coming down the pike for Great Hearts Harvesting. Uh, please sign our interest list if you haven't already. Please send it to your friends as well so that we can get the word out about Great Hearts Harvest and follow us on social media as well. Uh, follow us, Great Hearts Harvest, and on social media and sign up for our interest list and send the interest list to your friends or anybody who might be interested. Uh, we'd love that. In two weeks, we are going to be at the Chick-fil-A on Segan Road. If you come, we'll buy your ice cream. We'll buy the whole meal, but we'll buy you ice cream. It's just a meet and greet, an informal meet and greet Please bring the kids. They can play in the play place. And you can meet me. You can meet my uh, leadership team, Ms. Kesa Johnson, my director of campus operations. And you can also uh, meet uh, Alicia Carellis, my director of community engagement. You can meet us at the Chick-fil-A on Segan Road uh, uh, on the 28th of July. All right. And just a few more facts. We're tuition free. In summary, we're a tuition free classical education. We're a tuition free classical school. We're opening in the fall of 23, serving grades K through seven, and we'll grow a, a grade level each year until we are a full K-12 uh, for the city of Baton Rouge. All right. It's been wonderful being with you all. Um, I think I may have broken my five minute rule in the, uh, in the definition of classical education, and I, I apologize for that. But I am so passionate about talking, uh, so passionate about talking about classical education. Feel free to email me any questions you might have. Feel free to uh, email me if you want to catch up, get lunch, or if you want to have a Zoom. I'm happy to to attend to individual uh, questions and, and concerns as well. I want you to know I'm your head map, I'm your head of school, and I'm available to you, uh, and would love to meet with you. My team would love to meet with you as well. We look forward to seeing you in the community, and uh, thank you for the time. This, is, uh, this has been great. Uh, hoping to see you at future Great Hearts Harvesting events.